Welcome to Trialside News Podcast Series. Today we have Dr. Timur Alptunair joining us to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic. He's an ER doctor specializing in disaster and operation medicine and army officer. He works in D.C. for George Washington and teaches at Uniformed Services University. So, Dr. Timur, welcome. Hi. uh, Thanks for having me. Yes, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. The pleasure is ours. Now, we want to thank you for taking the time. We know you're busy to participate on the Trial Site News podcast series. So, uh, if you would, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get into medicine and what was your initial interest? So with a lot of other doctors, uh, my desire started at a young age. My uh, mother was a surgical technologist. She was a healthcare professional who handed the tools and assisted surgeons uh, in surgery. So I kind of grew up in a hospital setting. So that that was a desire of mine uh, from the beginning. And one of my developments over time is surviving and going through uh, Hurricane Katrina and then later on observing things like the Indonesian tsunami in 2004 kind of got me into the the realm of international disaster relief. Um, I wanted to do something when Hurricane Katrina happened, but being a a victim, it's kind of hard to uh, help others. So later on in life, I went into emergency medicine because I had the desire to go into the adrenaline. I always saw myself from a young age being a lifeguard running towards an incident as opposed to running away from. From then on, I ended up going into emergency medicine after going to medical school at LSU New Orleans. I did residency at SUNY Stony Brook in Long Island, New York. After that, I ended up joining a fellowship for specialty training in disaster and operational medicine. Uh, This is where we focus kind of on the disaster cycle, how to manage disasters from like a larger 10,000 foot view. And one of those instances where I got to implement my training was Team Rubicon in 2019 with the Cyclone Adai in Mozambique, Africa, where we worked with the World Health Organization to treat and help the the local people in the city of Bera, Mozambique. Since then, I've been helping teach with the Uniformed Service University with some operations and and kind of just now, I've been kind of helping with the local medical reserve corps, where we are helping the local government in drive-through testing and and whatnot. Wow. Now, Although Trial Site News focuses on clinical research, we are interested in improving and progressing the entire healthcare system. Now, we've noticed many doctors must work for big healthcare systems now, and, and that there is, or it seems to be, less engagement and connection with the patient. Now, has this been your experience? So, what I've noticed historically is that there's been a, a, a movement from small single physician groups with primary care several decades ago now to groups of physicians that then work under a hospital system currently. In the emergency medicine, which is a new field started in the 70s, it began as small democratic groups and now we have larger contract medical groups. And these groups are a little bit larger. I know some physicians work under hospitals as employees also. Unfortunately, business interests have infiltrated uh, healthcare systems. And so we've, we've now seen a focus from patient interest to more of bottom lines, profit margins, and, and catering to the shareholders. Physicians, we took an oath to put patients first and to do no harm. So, you know, the focus for physicians has always remained the same. And our job was always to advocate for the patients. So no matter who we work under, our goals are always to advocate for physician uh, patients. Where right. Our goal is to advocate for patients. That's good to hear. So, so what then, shifting gears here, what then about COVID-19? What are your thoughts on this pandemic? Should our federal government have been more prepared? And what about state governments, public health agencies, and the like? We appreciate your feedback. So that's a good question. So obviously the coronavirus is, is something that's on the forefront uh, for everyone today. Uh, The federal government has experienced pandemics in the past. If we can look back, the H1N1 in 2009 and the Ebola outbreak in Western Africa did prepare the United States for a public health emergency such as this pandemic. Unfortunately, what we say in the disaster community is that we have after action reports and lessons learned. And unfortunately, sometimes those lessons learned are lessons observed or lessons relearned. Uh, because we will make reports. However, we do not sometimes learn or implement what we learned from the last mistakes and the last observations. So with Ebola, uh, we trained for that, yet it kind of fell off the news cycle. So investors 
do not spend a lot of money towards that. So currently, prior to the coronavirus was a very important subject, which was mass casualty situations and active shooters. So a lot of investments went towards active shooters, which rightfully so it should be. However, you have to look at all hazards that can affect the, the public health system and pandemic is one of them. Recently, they had a test called the Crimson scenario, where it was a pandemic influenza. And that showed similar situation to now, which is a pandemic coronavirus, which are not much different on a public health standpoint. So we knew that this was coming. And I believe that maybe we were a little flat footed, but I believe that this goes all the way from the, the single individual mm-hmm. to, to the federal government. So humans, uh, you know, local U.S. citizens, FEMA recommends that we have a 72 hours of of food and water and supplies to be self-sustaining, which I would say that most people are not at this time and weren't prior to this pandemic. In in the likes of that, only three out of 10, about 30 percent of U.S. individuals have enough savings for an emergency fund. Uh, So from the federal government to the local, I believe that this kind of caught us all flat-footed. And, and I believe that it's kind of hard to conceptualize a pandemic influenza before it happens. And it was just kind of hard to be prepared for this. Obviously, there is certain disconnects, but there's still room for us to coordinate and, and improve on this. I agree. Now, we have seen some researchers warn about a quote-unquote bat coronavirus that could be more dangerous. It is scary how this virus has evolved to be far more contagious. Do you think there is more of this coming? So I think what these researchers are trying to point out here is what we call zoonotic diseases or diseases that come from animals. Now, this isn't what we say novel. You know, this is not something new to us in the healthcare field. Remember, Lyme disease is a zoonotic infection. Right. Uh, In the 1980s, Ebola was almost released into Virginia near... Washington, D.C., and it was discovered it was the Reston Ebola virus strain, and it's the one of six Ebola strains that is fortunately not deadly to humans. Now, if that was deadly to humans, we would have had a different kind of outbreak than what happened in the 80s. Hmm. So think we are at a potential for pandemics all the time, um, and it's not just specific to China or bat virus. I think Unfortunately, this can create a lot of xenophobia among the U.S. population, and we just need to realize that bubonic plague is endemic to southwest United States, and hantavirus is on the West Coast, and other zoonotic diseases that are very deadly are around us everywhere, and that this is what happens when we are juxtaposed to the natural environment and encroach on those natural areas. So I, I think the more that Uh, the population expands and the more we are globalized, I think we'll be more at risk. For example, for the Ebola, it is seen to possibly come from a bat or what they call, quote, bush meat that then transfers to humans. Now, previously, this was endemic in this one area, but with motorized vehicles and planes and the globalization technology, we're seeing that a virus that can be very deadly can transfer the world very quickly. And we're experiencing that now. Fortunately, Ebola is uh, patients present much more sick early on. So it's easy to screen like we were trying to do with coronavirus at airports is if they present with a fever, we can isolate them and treat them quickly before they spread it to others. Now, what I am concerned about in the future is that we have a little bit more of an infectious, um, what we call virulent virus with a higher pathogenicity. So think of a virus that is just as infectious as this coronavirus, but with a mortality rate of Ebola of 70%. Now that would be much more worrisome. And if that hits somewhere like New York City or a place like Lagos, Nigeria, it would have detrimental effects. So with this coronavirus having such a low mortality rate, I think that this can be a lesson learned and hopefully it's a lesson learned for any future pandemics that we may experience, that this puts us the preparedness for pandemics on the forefront and that we invest in such so we cannot take this situation lightly in the future. Agreed. Now, we know that you have emergency disaster preparedness background. Can you share how relevant that is to the novel coronavirus pandemic today? 
What lessons learned did you pick up on that that are relevant? Um, so from the disaster preparedness background that I've had, things that I've learned is the whole disaster cycle. So the disaster cycle goes from um, what we call left of boom. That is basically the preparation prior to the incident. And then you have the, the response after it and the mitigation while you're responding. So, and then preparedness again. So it comes full circle of how a disaster cycle works and that there's always room for improvement. There's always room for preparedness and prevention and then mitigation. So if the incident happens in the future, the amount of detriment to that community is lessened. For example, I'm from New Orleans and levee systems are a good way to prevent and mitigate a disaster. So as, as, I, as I emphasized prior, uh, preparedness is key. And I think that in the future, I think we need to invest more into preparedness. Uh, one leader of the International Federation of the Red Cross stated, one dollar invested in preparedness is worth four dollars in response. Now, this shows you that we should invest more in the future for pandemic response. But unfortunately, it's hard to spend money on an incident before it happens. So similar for the Cascadia fault line, it is, it is known that there can be a, a very large earthquake in the future. So preparedness is key for this, which will be a very large earthquake. However, to invest in something that has not happened yet is very difficult. Another part in disaster preparedness is drilling and preparing. And recently CMS has been requiring us to have, uh, CMS has required us to take mass casualty drills once yearly. Now these drills are usually active shooter drills or mass casualty incidences that are traumatic. Unfortunately, as we see now, short one hour to two hour drills of a few traumatic incidents, traumatic victims, does not strain the supply chain or resources that we are seeing being strained here. So it's kind of difficult to prepare for something that strains your resources so much. So then let's let's shift then to this next question, which is elements within our government appears to have been caught flat-footed in our response. Now, in fact, we did the local New Orleans podcast and uh, a few weeks ago and found that few actually were there to help in an orchestrated way at first. Is this your general observation as well? So being a survivor of Hurricane Katrina, I can tell you, all disasters are local. Now, what do I say by that is the local government individuals are the first to respond to a local disaster. So after Hurricane Katrina, who showed up to help? The Cajun Navy, the local sheriff department. So when we are in a disaster, we should rely on our local resources and our local government and our neighbors. So FEMA could have been involved sooner, I, I agree. But FEMA is a large entity, and it takes a while for them to ramp up their supplies. So prior to FEMA being an entity that responds, the local government has to be able to mitigate any disaster. So we have to rely on these local health departments in early on in, in disasters, and it's, it's key for them to be prepared. For example, the nursing homes in, in Washington would not have benefited from an early government response because it happened much more quickly than a federal response would allow. So this would have to rely on the local health department, and the local health department needs to be more involved in disaster preparedness. So do you have ideas of how we are doing with COVID-19 and, and how we can improve? Um, so obviously with the coronavirus, this is a response that takes public health measures. So right now, there's a lot of talk of flattening the curve. Um, the purpose of the flattening the curve from a public health standpoint is to prolong this so we can implement some scientific implementations such as vaccines or medications. However, these need to be vetted and they need to be studied before they can be implemented. So while we are doing social isolation, we need to rely on the researchers and the public health specialists and the epidemiologists to find ways of mitigating uh, this disaster. And, and while we flatten the curve, they shorten the curve. So right now, 
we are, I think the government is doing a good job at mitigating this as best they can. Unfortunately, we're still, if you look at Johns Hopkins GIS model, we are still in the exponential curve. So we still have a lot to do to see the fruits of our labors of social distancing, unfortunately. But we need to work even harder on the research aspect and find uh, a cure or a vaccine. But this needs to be researched and vetted. So there is there is talks about hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. However, there's only a few studies on this. So we need to rely on those people doing bench research to figure out if this medication is effective and if the benefits outweigh the risk. All physicians make these decisions when implementing medication strategies for their patients. So with these medications, there are adverse effects and there is possibly benefits. And we need the research to show a statistical difference between the two. In addition to this, I, I think one way we can, we can improve is with information sharing with ease of communication. We're seeing that with right now with decreases in HIPAA practices with telemedicine. HIPAA is patient privacy, and we are relaxing that to assist with telemedicine so we can reach more patients um, at this time of emergency. One other way we can improve is increasing our supply chain. So I am seeing the Defense Production Act being enacted to increase ventilators. We need to increase testing swabs. We need to increase the production of swabs themselves and PPE. So if we can ramp up our supply chain, I believe that is one way we can improve and mitigate the effects of healthcare worker infections because if we protect our healthcare workers, we can care for more people. So Adrian, so it's easy to play Monday morning quarterback, but we're trying to focus right now on the economy, but I think our, our focus still needs to be on our public health response. Uh, while millions have the possibility of being hospitalized and hundreds of thousands or mortality is at risk, I think our policy still should be focused more on public health and safety measures before we can start pivoting back to taking care of our economic problems. So what then do you think could have been done earlier? More testing, more containment, anything like that? Obviously, so and it's been said time and time again that we need more testing. Um, and testing is good for a public health and epidemiologic standpoint. So we can do source tracing and isolate individuals before they can spread it to other people. As you saw in some of the studies coming out, a majority of the people who are infected with the SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS that causes COVID-19 is they are asymptomatic carriers. What this means is there's a lot of people who are going around uh, stating that they have their normal seasonal allergies, or I usually get a cold like this every year, are actually the people spreading it. They have simple rhinorrhea, a runny nose, and then they rub their nose and touch your grocery cart handle, which then spreads it to other at-risk people who then either become hospitalized or have something that happens to them worse. Um, so I think testing needs to get ramped up, and I think we could have been testing earlier and, and while we're doing testing in isolation, then we can still continue to put more investments in the best treatments or vaccination as needed. So let me switch gears here for a second. We did an article recently that it appears that China censored a good deal of the information in at least the month of December and perhaps even earlier in November. Uh, now, if so, they indirectly cost the lives of many more people. Now, if this is true, do you think that the censure of COVID-19 uh, data there made it worse in some ways? Now, it's, it's easy to blame uh, China for the pandemic that's going on in the United States. I know that the CIA recently reported, you know, that there was, in February, some underreporting going on by China. Unfortunately, that then passes the buck and our, our personal responsibility to another country for our public health. Historically speaking, We've seen China limit their reporting data in such pandemics, such as H1N1. So in those situations, we should have expected that something similar was going to happen. We knew that there was something going on and a highly infectious disease was happening in China. I believe that that should have been our call for action 
and our call to ramp up measures that in case this spread to the United States, that we would be prepared. We see other countries had the same data. However, their mitigation strategies has been a little bit more effective, such as South Korea and Singapore. So let's shift gears again here. Have you ever been involved with any clinical research? And if yes, could you share your high-level experience and what importance you place on real-world evidence studies? Example, using a use of large troves of electronic health data. So in my experience in clinical research, I recently uh, published a, a validation study on uh, the use of Narcan. Now, obviously, the opioid crisis is still going on and is still relevant. And my Narcan uh, research was dose dependence on adverse effects of Narcan. Now, research like this is very important and it is translatable to today. Um, as in my study, Narcan can save lives, but only if it's appropriately given in the right dose. And my research can, looked into this. So we can extrapolate that to our COVID-19 pandemic now, and we can talk again about the hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin medication that uh, everyone is talking about. Now, this is a drug that might have great results. However, we need to analyze the data and realize that some of the side effects are life-threatening. Hydroxychloroquine has known to do what we call prolong your QT interval. Now, that is a part of the EKG that measures your electric rhythm of your heart. Now, if your QT becomes too prolonged, you can have a fatal heart arrhythmia called ventricular tachycardia. Now, this is fatal, and I believe research is needed to find the appropriate dose. Just like Narcan can appropriately save a life at the appropriate dose, maybe these medications can appropriately treat COVID-19, but maybe there's a dosage that needs to be researched, and we need to leave this to the experts and researchers. Recently, I published an op-ed in the New York Times referring to unsubstantiated medical claims and non-pharmaceutical measures to combat the coronavirus. Now, one thing that I pointed out in the article is that we need to leave the medical advice to the medical experts. We utilize biostatistics and scrutinize scientific literature, and we do not take anything as gospel, but we usually take things with a grain of salt, and we like to analyze and scrutinize all the data that comes to us so we can better treat our patients effectively and ethically. So then, do you think that experiences from COVID-19 will help contribute to a new and more accessible healthcare model, like insurance companies make coverage easier and so on and so forth? Adrian, I like to be an optimist. So I think yes. that from this incident, I think good will come from this. We're seeing now patients being stuck with a very large bill because they're being treated for uh, the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, and they do not have the savings for this. I can see this as a, a reason for people to advocate for a universal healthcare model. So we're seeing currently a fee-for-service model, and because there's cuts to specialists on their elective surgeries, um, they're having no services right now, and they have no ability to pay for their overhead. Uh, another thing that should be analyzed after this in the healthcare model is what we call MTLA and HIPAA. Mm -hmm. MTLA was passed uh, decades ago, and it regards that anyone who shows up to the emergency department needs to have a medical screening exam. Now, what will happen with this medical exam can be now shifted to what we're seeing is telemedicine or what we call telehealth. So can we screen patients at their home instead of requiring them to come to the emergency department because of some previous bureaucratic law? Maybe patients in the future can use telehealth as they're doing now to see if they need to be screened for coronavirus or COVID-19 to help answer questions or get counseling. Because when patients have answers and it's not business hours, they're usually referred to the emergency department for their regular questions that do not need to be treated emergently. Another thing is with telehealth is what I stated before is HIPAA. HIPAA is the Patient Privacy Act where patient privacy is 
stringent and it's very hard to relay patient data to other healthcare clinicians. So calling other physicians at another hospital requires lots of paperwork and lots of signatures which would otherwise help a patient in an emergent standpoint. So I think in the future, after COVID-19 pandemic, I think there will be some shifts and some reevaluations of our current practices that I think may better the U.S. population and our patients in the future. We really appreciate your feedback. So Dr. Timur, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day to speak with us. Your input has been extremely valuable and we wish you all the best in the work that you do. Thank you so much for having me, Adrian. And I wish everyone to stay safe and see you on the other side of this pandemic. See you on the other side.